Hello, Dr. Fisher here. Today we are talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, something I've been doing a lot of research on it from my own perspective. Uh, it's something I struggle with in my own life. Uh, I guess I'm an out-of-the-closet perfectionist. So today what we're going to talk about is did Brene Brown know what she was talking about? Uh, is perfectionism rooted in shame? Is that a real thing? Does she have it right? So we're also going to talk about today how perfectionism uh, is going to destroy, is perfectionism going to destroy us in the long run? I think it will, yes. And so we're also going to talk about how to move away from this idea of destroying oneself in perfectionism and find some abilities to change and heal. And we're going to reference several people that I find to be super inspirational and I draw a lot from their work. So you're going to be hearing me drop several names today. We're also going to talk about goal setting and the ability to let go of the perfectionism. How to do that. Kind of in a step-by-step -step process. This is one that I struggled with. I still struggle with to some degree as I work through this process. And then if you'll stay to the end where we'll be talking about the keys to success with perfectionism and who Brene Brown specifically found in her research that changed her life and her work forever with that ability to neutralize the shame of perfectionism, you're going to be in for a treat. And it's going to move you forward in that direction of healing and to be able to have better relationships. So without further ado, we're actually going to start from Brene Brown's recent book, which she used as a collaboration between her and a ton of other people, which is the book that I refer to all the time in my clinical setting, uh, Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. Uh, and here, on page 142, if you want to turn there with me, she talks about perfectionism. So we're going to read and we're going to refer to a lot of what she says. So what she talks about is she just finished talking about shame and how that emotion when we identify with this is super destructive. And she said, shame is the birthplace of perfectionism. Perfectionism, uh, this is an important piece to remember too, perfectionism is not striving to be our best or working towards excellence. Healthy striving is internally driven. Perfectionism is externally driven by a simple but potentially all-consuming question, what will people think? Now. I want to pause here for just a second because I, I think it's important to understand where the root of this particular aspect comes from, right? Why do we care about what other people think? Well, there's a lot of science rooted in understanding this idea. So there's also a term called internalizing and externalizing from the author of Adult Children of Immature Parents. And when we externalize and we focus outside of ourselves, it's hard to be able to make these changes that we're looking for. So that's a really important piece to be able to understand that perfectionism is rooted outside of yourself, external factors. And so why are we focusing so much though on an external factor? This is something that has plagued me personally for years and years. Well, one of the important pieces is to be able to understand the distinction between a person's ability to honor oneself and attachment. And so what happens as a small child when we're trying to get our needs met, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, on the bottom is food, water, shelter. And so if we don't have someone who's going to be able to provide those basic food, waters, and shelter piece, we're going to die. So this is about death, okay? I'm going to dramatize it. This is about death here. So when we're small, when we're trying to get our needs met, what we do is we give up that authentic self in an adaption exchange for attachment and getting our basic needs met. So what oftentimes happens is about 50% of us are in a position where our parents weren't given the necessary tools and or the knowledge and or the mindset to be able to be there for us to meet more than just our physical needs and to meet our emotional needs. And that's oftentimes where this perfectionism comes from is when we externalize and we try and take care of our needs from that particular perspective, 
then we get driven to this idea of perfectionism. So we're going to go into that a little bit more. Hopefully that was helpful in understanding where this idea comes from. So she goes on to talk about, and she says, it may seem counterintuitive, but one of the biggest barriers to working towards mastery is perfectionism. So she's done a ton of research, and what they learned in that process is that mastery, right, the ability to know it so well, requires curiosity. And that requires to be in a certain mindset. And in this in this mindset of curiosity, you have to be able to view mistakes and failures as opportunities for learning. And so this idea of perfectionism kills this curiosity by, in our minds, uh, telling us, or we hear that inner critic say that we have to know everything. So this is one that I struggle with. Or we risk losing everything. And, or we risk losing like we're less than. So perfectionism tells us that our mistakes and failures are personal defects. So we either try and avoid trying new things or we barely recover every time we inevitably fall short. Now for me, my choice is typically I try new things. And so this is something my wife would say that she hates, but I keep educating myself, learning and bouncing to the next thing. And so it's really important to understand again why? So, in her book, The Gifts of Perfection, The Gifts of Imperfection, this is her old book right here, awesome book. She explains how perfectionism emerged from her research, and she gives a definition, right? So she says the definition that best fit the data is that perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. If I look perfect, live perfectly, work perfectly, and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. Right? Shame, judgment, and blame. I can avoid these ideas. I can avoid these feelings that are so painful. They've definitely been, they're definitely, in my experience, very painful. Right? So it's really important to understand that perfectionism, perfectionism is not self-improvement. So if you think you're in a fantasy world like I was for many, many years that, oh, I'm just trying to improve myself. I, I have to be perfect. I have to know all this stuff. Perfectionism, perfectionism is at its core about trying to earn approval and acceptance. That's what I've been working at all these years. So if this is something that resonates with you, it's important for you to be able to check. Am I trying to gain approval of a, a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, church culture, uh, societal culture. So most perfectionists, as she goes on, were raised being praised for achievement and performance, like good grades, good manners, nice appearance, sports, prowess, rule following, people pleasing. So like these aren't bad things, but what happens is, is from the context of you know, as a small child, the perception of a small child is my parents always give me kind of kudos and support me when I'm a straight-A student or when I'm an amazing soccer player or when I'm looking in a certain way, winning these scholarships or whatever the case may be. And so somewhere along the way, what happens is we adopt this dangerous and debilitating belief system, right? We go from trying to, to drive in a healthy way to what she says, I, it, we identify with this. I am what I accomplish and how well I accomplish it. Please, perform, perfect. Healthy striving, on the other hand, is self-focused, right? So rather than saying, what do I need to be identified as in order to be able to gain acceptance from this person and be perfect in their eyes so I can get my needs met, right? What will they think? how do I transition that to healthy striving? That's going to be more self-focused. How do I strive for excellence and be healthy? So it's important to understand the difference, she goes on to say, between healthy striving and perfectionism, because it's critical to laying down the shield, which is the perfectionism piece. It's super heavy, takes a lot of energy to use, and picking up your life. Research shows that perfectionism hampers success, and I would say from my own experience as well as with patients that I work with, that is absolutely 100% true. 
In fact, it often sets you on the path to depression, been there, done that, anxiety, been there, done that, addiction, been there, done that, and life paralysis, definitely been there, done that. And I have so many patients who are struggling with this exact same thing. You know who I'm talking about. And so this idea of life paralysis refers to all the opportunities we miss because we're too afraid to put anything out in the world that could be imperfect. So I'll give you another example. I've been working on trying to, I've had an idea for a class and or course that I, my business coach tried to get me to do it five years ago and I've been working on it in my mind and whatnot, but I have, I've had this, life paralysis or business paralysis because of this fear of what other people will think. So I'm currently working through that. And you can too. It's also all of the dreams that we don't follow because of our deep fear of failing, making mistakes and disappointing others. It's terrifying to risk when you're a perfectionist. Your self-worth is on the line. So that's super duper important and I share that with patients all the time. So these unattainable standards, standards that perfectionism requires revolves again around setting impossibly high standards, for example, for ourselves in different parts of our life. So there may be different aspects of our life that we're being triggered in. So for example, one of my big ones is in my relationship with my wife. I, I get triggered and I'm trying to be a perfectionist and then I have paralysis and I become dependent on that situation and it overloads me and I stop and it's disabling of my relationship. And so it's been really, really difficult for myself and my wife to be able to work through that. So it, it does take a fair amount of work to, to work through this, but I have every intention of following through with this. So with that being said, it's really important to understand that fear of failure in this and or judgment of others is really normal, right? Again, we talked about the idea of fear of making mistakes, also experiencing failure because we, we feel like we're gonna be perceived as inadequate, right? That fear drives us. For example, for my own self, I, I tend to overwork, overprepare. I'm constantly striving to try and know everything, which is totally on multiple occasions, led me to feelings of burnout, feeling anxiety, lots and lots of shame, right? This, this inner critic that really drains lots of my energy. And so, Oftentimes too, depending on our levels of maturity and where we're at and what part is being triggered, we will get into this black and white, all or nothing thinking, where perfectionism often involves around this idea of a rigid mindset. Uh, and so we focus on the idea of outcomes as either perfect or a failure. Again, it's that black and white. For me, in my mind, that tells me, hey, that's an area where I'm probably not super mature in and there's some stuff I need to work on from my childhood in relation to that. So it leaves little room for growth and frankly, no resilience. And it can limit us. It, it doesn't allow us to be creative. It doesn't allow for exploration. And we then can't take any risks. So another big piece that she talks about is this idea that self-worth is oftentimes associated with achievement. I know this is applicable to me. So oftentimes my own self-worth has been a feeling of less than because external accomplishments didn't happen or I'm looking for an external validation or praise because again my value is rooted in what is other people thinking about me all right and so it leads to dissatisfaction uh, this idea of never feeling good enough and so I'm sure there's lots of you out there who is also struggling with this particular piece and it's really really important to understand and that leads us to another big piece which is hearth harsh self-criticism you know i was doing some inner work recently uh with a colleague and or therapist uh, myself and i had this inner dialogue with my my inner child and my harsh criticism or my self-critic is so harsh that i know this sounds funny but my inner child wanted nothing to do with me because i have a tendency to be so self-critical and so it was just a really interesting exchange so that's definitely something i'm working on personally too but again it can erode self-esteem and inhibit our personal growth it allows us to not do what, uh, what Brene brown talks about which is to be vulnerable it creates this fake shield uh, against you being able to grow and 
gives you the false sense that you can somehow control outcomes and, and be being exposed to judgment or criticism. And that prevents us from having genuine connection with others and ham hampers our ability to fully embrace ourselves. I know this is definitely something that's really been a struggle for me. So, you know, I remember when I first read this and I struggled with the idea of implementing what was necessary to get moving, partially because I wasn't in reality, as well as, you know, being able to move forward and have clarity of focus and know where to draw inspiration from and how to apply these things and, and, and move forward. So Simon Sinek is another person who I draw a lot of inspiration from where he talks about the importance of a growth mindset, the ability to embrace change, view failures as an opportunity for learning, to be able to cultivate this idea of self-awareness, which has been around for thousands of years, by the way, by reflecting on my own emotions, my own behaviors, my patterns of thinking, which is often painful, by the way. And so for my own self, for example, I have a team of people that I work with because this has been stuff that's really deep-rooted inside of me. So I see a couple of different people on my team regularly to provide guidance and accountability as I work through my own stuff. So it's important that you surround yourself with people, if you can tolerate that, in your community to be able to encourage growth and healing. And it's really important, for example, as James Clear talks about, the idea of setting small and consistent goals to be able to take these little small steps forward. If, if you haven't been to the gym, for example, and you're trying to go and lift 500 pounds, it's very likely that you're one of few people, one in a million, that could just go in there and lift that. The majority of us have to break that down into smaller chunks where we're lifting like, you know, one, two, three, four, five pounds at a time to be able to get started in the process. So it's really important to understand also for you to understand your values. As you identify these goals, what's important to you? How do you break things down into small enough pieces where you can actually get forward motivation, right? Also, what inside of yourself provides these motivations? Again, part of that's going to be understanding your values. Is family important? Is education important? Is how you look important? You know, what, what are your goals? What are your priorities? And once you understand that, that's going to give you more of an intrinsic motivation to be able to work through this process. Then you can set specific goals. Again, if they're making it so it's impossible for you to move, it's important for you to kind of pull those goals back and keep pulling those goals back and keep pulling those goals back until you can get to that one to five pound perspective where you're actually getting some forward movement. And it's important to, as Stephen R. Covey says, define clear and measurable goals that are realistic and achievable because as you break those larger goals into those small, more manageable tasks, the one to five pounds, that's going to make this process move much easier. And then you can shift your energy from what you were doing before and getting stuck to being able to be in the right mindset, to be able to have the growth and embrace the risk and to be in a mindset that allows for curiosity to move you forward. And then you can start embracing these mistakes and these failures as learning opportunities. And so at this point in time, it's really important to be able to share that last piece, which is that amazing component that's called self-compassion, which is a neutralizer of shame, which Brene Brown found through Kristen Neff. And Kristen Neff talks, several, talks about several different ways to cultivate self-compassion. She talks about the importance of celebrating progress and effort, even if the outcomes fall short of perfection. Cultivating this self-acceptance and letting go of the, sh uh, the harsh self-judgment. Also, seeking opportunities for other people to support you and provide additional accountability. Now, it's going to take some time and energy usually to balance and heal from perfectionism. And in many ways, it'll be a lifelong thing. So I wanted to break down the three key aspects that Kristen Neff talks about with self-compassion. The first being self-kindness. She talks about the importance of treating yourself with kindness, gentleness, and understanding, just as you would treat a dear friend. That means things like offering words of comfort and encouragement 
to yourself during challenging times. I know that's super weird sometimes. It's still weird for me. It's still something that I'm working on implementing more, but it also works. I've seen it in my own personal life as well as working with patients. It's also important to a engage in acts of self-care and prioritize your own well-being. I love the idea of, if you've ridden in a plane recently, to be reminded of what happens if the oxygen levels drop and you're way high up in the air. What happens? The stewardess says the oxygen masks are going to come down from the top a part of the plane or of overhead. And what's going to happen is if you want to be able to take care of the people that are next to you that you love and care about, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. The second piece for her is this idea of common humanity, which is recognizing that you're not alone in experiencing pain, failure, and imperfection. It's a shared human experience. We all experience that. And so in order to be able to cultivate empathy and compassion for others, fostering that sense of connection with other people and understanding is essential to your well-being. Also being able to reflect on the universal struggles that we all encounter, especially if we're in a place where we feel isolated. She also talks about, and this is the third part, the idea of mindfulness. And so what that means in her definition is the ability to develop a non-judgmental awareness of your thoughts, emotions, and sensations. And so it's important to be able to approach your experiences again with this idea of curiosity, openness. It allows you to be in the mindset to allow yourself to fully acknowledge and accept them. And until you can get into that place where you can fully acknowledge, come out of you know, a place where maybe you're not in reality and find acceptance of them, they're going to continue to be a problem and they're going to negatively influence your life, right? So I, I do think Brene Brown has it right. And we've got to neutralize the shame. We've got to neutralize this perfectionism piece and allow ourselves to be brought up to and honor and have courage and be vulnerable and recognize our own humanity. Practice these mindful techniques. It's important to, to do things like meditation or deep breathing or present moment awareness. Uh, there's a lot of different things from Brene Brown, Kirsten, Kristen Neff, as well as many other people. Brene Brown talks about the idea of embracing vulnerability and recognizing that those imperfections are part of our own human experience. That allows you to, like Kirsten, Kristen Neff said, cultivate that self-compassion, learning how to have that self-talk, which is going to neutralize, as you're speaking to yourself with kindness and understanding, that negative critic. And to be able to then re-engage yourself in these kind, nourishing ways that will support your mind, body, and soul. And again, it's important to be able to seek trusted friends and family and, and get support from them. And for a lot of us, like myself, we need professionals who can provide that empathy and understanding and hold space for the complexities of these things. So as you practice these skills and you learn from all these giants in their field, like Kristen Neff, Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, James Clear, Stephen Covey, right? De developing this sense of self-compassion will help you heal from perfectionism and to feel your emotions of shame and to be able to learn how to accept yourself as a human being and let go of these old ways and learn how to have a better life, be able to be open to happiness and connection. And it's a really beautiful glorious experience if you allow yourself to experience it. it's kind of like a flower blooming right you can't force the process you can't shove on the flowers or squeeze it or whatever to get it to open up faster it will take time but i know from my own experience that it's also life changing and transformative so if that's something that's interesting to you and you want to be able to change your life by practicing this self-acceptance and self-compassion, I promise it's going to be worth every effort and energy that you put into it. So if you want to have a reference to the books and some of the people that I said, I'll put it a list, list to the references below. Like and subscribe if you like our content, and we'll talk to you soon. This is Dr. Fisher signing out.